Wow, it's really interesting to see uh, all the people here. Uh, I know you folks have been uh, doing the, the avocado business for a while and it's really interesting to hear all these questions. And you know, I wrote down a bunch of uh, uh, notes and I hope I can cover some of those issues that you folks brought up because I'm all about uh, not just talking about problems or challenges, but I'm also more about providing a solution because we always go to a lot of these uh, seminars or these conferences and we hear about all the problems, but how about some solutions? And so that's what I'm gonna to try to do. Okay, my name's Terry Gong and I'm with Harman Systems International and our company is the company that invented and pioneered the concept of burning sulfur to create SO2 gas on site to create sulfurous acid. And I'm also the person that wrote the petition to allow this particular process to be approved for organic crop production. And it took me about 10 years to do. There was reorganization of the USDA uh, to take over the uh, organic program and they had to consolidate things, but it gave me time to really come back and look at that petition and get some help on it, but also to really solidify the arguments and be prepared for that. And uh, it, was a, it was a really uh, life-changing process because it really helped me understand the bigger picture of everything. And so I'm gonna really try to show you the big picture in all this. Okay. Uh, my presentation agenda is uh, I'm going to illustrate how nature controls pH. I'm going to talk about the importance of pH in agriculture, explain the causes of uh, our irrigated farmland what, to, to become uh, salt affected. I'm going to explain uh, why uh, Harman SO2 sulfurous acid generator is the most cost effective way to amend and control pH and then obviously take questions. Now, I want to make sure that I don't make this into a commercial, and I, I've refrained from doing that, but the reason why I'm mentioning Harman is because we invented the, the equipment in 1955, and there have been people trying to copy the concept because, you know, the concept is there, but they're not always the same, and so the in terms of uh, how efficient they are and how much uh, emissions they release uh, and then also the amount of acidity they produce. So they're not all the same, and I just want to talk about how our process works. Okay, so you're trying to solve a problem. When you're trying to solve a problem in nature, when you're dealing with nature, what's your reference point? You gotta have a reference point. The ancient mariners used the North Star when they were navigating the, the oceans because they didn't know whether the, the earth was flat or round. I use the example of a Rubik's Cube too. Rubik's Cube is a fantastic uh, teaching tool because you know these people that speed cube, they're so fast with it, it's amazing. But one of the things that they do it, when they teach people how to speed cube is take it apart. When they take it apart, they find that the center cubelets never move and whatever color is on that center cubelet, that is the uh, color of that face. Now, so how many times have you picked up a Rubik's Cube and you start working on it, but then you find you can't get anywhere? You're, you know, or maybe you get really close to being done, but then you realize that it may take 20, 60 more moves to complete it. Well, imagine that's what's happening when you're farming. You're trying to solve a problem, but where's your starting point? You have to have a starting point, a reference. And so that's the point of this particular slide. Okay, the reference point is hydrogen. Why? Because 93% of all the atoms in the universe is purported to be hydrogen. So you could almost say that nature and hydrogen are almost one and the same, and what nature's really doing is merely recycling the element of hydrogen in all of the processes. So the nitrogen cycle, the carbon cycle, all these processes, they may be just uh, spin-offs, subsid subsidiaries of the major process, and that is to process hydrogen. How does nature recycle the element of hydrogen? Well, we're seeing it right now. We're seeing one volcano that seems to be on the news, Kilauea. It's been going on since 1981. 
and it's been spewing out SO2 gas, sulfur dioxide. And people, they, they spend all this time about seeing the lava and the fires, and then they talk about how bad the sulfur dioxide is. It's deadly, it can be, but this is what nature does. Nature does not pollute. This is what she does. And there is something that is important about volcanism because volcanism will burn the sulfur and turn it into SO2 and combine it with water vapor in the atmosphere. So if the volcano is on the surface of the earth, it's, it's, on, it's, it's going in the atmosphere. But, you know, 73% of the earth is covered by water. We've mapped less than 5% of the ocean floor. There is so much volcanism going on underneath the ocean, greater intensity and duration than anything on the surface, yet we never see it because it's suppressed. But here's the reaction of this chemistry that, that no one seems to talk about. The SO2 reacts with the water and turns into sulfurous acid, H2SO3. H2SO3 is an unstable compound, so the moment it forms it, it immediately breaks apart one of the hydrogen away from the uh, water. Now you have free hydrogen proton, which is acidity, and that neutralizes bicarbonate. HCO3 turns it into pure water and CO2. And then the bisulfite, the other uh, half of the acid is in the compound, and then it's, uh, it's oxidized by sulfur-feeding bacteria, chemolotrophic bacteria, thiobacillus, and so forth, that it will then turn the sulfite into sulfate, and when it does, it lets go of the other hydrogen. And then the same hydrogen, free acid, replicates the same chemistry by neutralizing the bicarbonate and turning it into pure water and CO2. My friends, this is the formation of water, that what nature does. This natural acidification process is, what, is how water is formed. And we need to be mindful of that because when we look at all of our water processing systems, earlier today, someone talked about recycled water as a key. Did you know that our recycled water uh, methods are actually exacerbating the alkalinity and the salt load to the water? Ventura County never used to have a problem with chlorides. I believe the, 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 the threshold is 122 ppm is the, is the agreement that was made that no chloride would exceed that level. It's exceeding it. Why? Because the wastewater treatment plants, like, such as Sacramento, they use chlorine. They produce chlorides. And then you think about all of the communities that discharge into the delta and introduce chlorides, and then that water is conveyed down the aqueduct and then brought into Ventura County. There's your chloride problem. It's emanating from the way we process water. Now, so if you look at volcanism, you, you see all these tectonic plates all around the uh, earth, and the volcanoes are not like Mount Shasta. They're actual Teutonic plates shifting, and there's the fissures, and they're, they're uh, emitting. Now, we've invented the robotic submersibles, and we send them down, and we turn on the lights, and lo and behold, we see that this volcanic activity is down there. And we sample the water. We find out that some of the pH of the water down in the ocean below is 1.0, very acidic. And we also find out that there's a hydrogen sulfide environment. Well, the hydrogen sulfide didn't get there from the, necessarily from the volcanic activity. It could have been because of the sulfate that was created. The anaerobes would then convert the sulfate because it's going after the oxygen from it and convert the hydrogen sulfide. So that's, that's why we see these environments. So I'm just basically illustrating what nature is doing because if we're going to be sustainable, we have to emulate what nature does because otherwise we're not being sustainable. Okay, more phenomena. Look at clean rain, 5.6. How many of you thought that, that clean rain is supposed to be 7-0? I would think most of you have. I would say I've been doing this since, oh, for 23 years, and one of the things that I'm always astounded about is that our greatest farmers, you folks, you forget what 
the finest irrigation water, the pH is, it's 5.6 is normal. That is why after it rains, it leaches salt and things grow miraculously because every organism is oriented to the pH of rain, water, or the pH of the planet. Now, look at this. This has mystified the scientific community even today with the scientists talking about climate change, global warming. Notice that ocean water, the percentage of bicarbonate is 0.42. And the percentage in fresh river water is 31.9. What happened to the CO2 in the oceans? They're saying that uh, the excess CO2 in the atmosphere is causing ocean acidification. I contend that that may not be the real case because the glasses of water that we have right here, my glass right there, that should turn into carbonic acid, but there isn't enough millibars of pressure to create that condition. But if we open up a soda pop can, it will go flat because there's not enough pressure to hold the CO2. So if this, is, this volcanism is happening underneath the ocean, then what's happening is it's neutralizing the bicarbonate, turning it into pure water, and the CO2 rises to the surface and vents into the atmosphere. And if there's any fluctuations going on in volcanism underneath the ocean, you, I guarantee you, you would see a, a fluctuation in CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, I'm not a climate scientist or anything, but I will tell you that if the scientists would just look at that, and I've actually had to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of them, if they would just look at that, they'd have to account for the mass balance effect of the chemistry of the volcanism underneath the ocean to be able to say whether it is indeed totally man-caused or part of nature. I just try to point out you know, what science is supposed to be, is to uncover the truth. Okay, now, this is a very interesting slide here. It isn't just total rainfall. It's also indicating the areas that sequester the most carbon, which is what you folks are trying to do with your farming ecosystem. So the areas that receive the highest amounts of rainfall sequester the most carbon. Now, think about this. Is, it, is the driver of the system the volume of water, or is it the volume of water combined with the amount of acidity, the amount of bisulfite, which is an electron donor to chemotrophic bacteria, which is a, probably the precursor of life form on this planet. It's, it's an actual organism that actually gets its energy from an inorganic compound, bisulfite. So as it changes the bisulfite to sulfate, this is what's being applied to the ecosystems that receive the highest amounts of rainfall. Interesting, because you're trying to sequester the same amount of carbon, so you have to recognize that, that, that it isn't just the volume of water, it's also the other constituents that are being added along with that water. Everything on, in, in nature has a purpose, and the role of volcanism is shifting us to adopting a new paradigm. Uh, if there's one life mission for me, I think it's to talk about volcanism. It's how the Earth recycles hydrogen, sulfur, carbon, oxygen, creates and processes water, deconstructs chemical compounds. That part about deconstructing chemical compounds is important because there is there were studies shown that bisulfite is a mechanism in which nitrate from water can be bioremediated. And then there's chemical compounds starting to be shown up in our uh, wastewater treatment facilities in large amounts, and these chemical compounds need to be broken down. Well, this is nature's deconstruction process. So, Volcanism resets the elements, self-adjusts the pH of the planet, feeds the bacteria, animals. This is how life on this planet is, is sustained. It's a reset button. Now, here is a picture of Bonneville and planet Mars on the surface. I contend 
And I've actually had to speak with the NASA scientists because I wrote a paper years ago talking about sustainable agriculture and they invited me to speak to them at Ames Research in New Mountain View. And when I got there, they told me, well, this is our goal. We want to go to Mars, but we can't take enough water and f uh, food. We have to grow everything and make it there, and oxygen. We have to grow it there. We, we're looking for a sustainable system. Well, that got me thinking. The only sustainable system that I know of is, is our planet. But we don't know a lot about all the processes, and so we have to understand how nature works in order to create a sustainable system. So we've landed uh, a rover on the surface. We sampled and tested the soil, and we find out that the pH is uh, high and also salt, salt carbon is indicating the presence of an uh, ocean that used to be. And we see the influence of hydrological activity on it, but yet we don't see an ocean or atmosphere. What happened? I contend it was a cessation of volcanism on that planet because having that acidification effect, that natural process underneath the ocean, creates new water, which provides dilution to keep the ocean from supersaturating out and precipitating out a solution. And that's how the CO2 for the atmosphere is released. So, you know, if you think about it, if we lost volcanism on this planet, could we go by the way of Mars? See, I'm, I'm looking for consistency in, in nature. And when you start to follow and, and track how nature recycles hydrogen, you start to realize that, oh, this it may well be indeed the starting point. Okay, I want to talk about normal rain. Okay, 5.6, so areas east of the Mississippi receive a high volume of rainfall. And so these ecosystems, because of that 5.6 acidic water, has leached the natural buffering capability of those ecosystems. That's why the pH of the soils are low. And so the farming strategy is to add what has been leached out of the soil. So they use a lot of dolomite lime because they're attempting to bring the pH back up that is compatible for the crops they're trying to grow. That's the strategy. And by the way, leave it to the government to get the colors backwards. Okay, so here, 140 inches of rainfall in the Olympic Peninsula. 108, or excuse me, 80, 90 inches of rainfall, maybe greater in the Carolinas and so forth, so the ecosystems are acidic. In our green little area here, we receive a low amount of rainfall. That is why our soil ecosystems still remain basic and alkaline. Okay, so our strategy for this area is to change the pH so that we can lower the pH of the uh, soil water solution that is suited genetically for the crop that you're trying to grow. Blueberries, they want a 5.4, 5, 5.5 pH, low pH, why? Because it's a rootstock that's from a high rainfall area, Oregon. You've got avocados. Avocados favor a certain pH because it, all the genetics of that crop came from a particular area. Okay, let me, let me talk about uh, acid rain. Okay, where do we do most of our coal burning? It's in the northeast, where the ecosystems have already lost their natural buffering capability. So as the SO2 gas goes in the atmosphere, and then the 5.6 rainwater falls through a plume of it, guess what? It picks up additional acidity, but it's falling uncontrollably around uh, or on meadows, rivers, the ecosystem forest that have already lost their natural buffering capability, so the pH goes lower. Now it's detrimental because when you lower the pH, you're solubilizing metals such as aluminum, and now you have aluminum toxicity, and then you get too low of pH for the fish and all of the, the life forms. We're practicing our coal burning in the wrong place. We should actually coal burn here because our ecosystem is alkaline, and we could use that acidity here but obviously we don't want to pollute, and I'm not advocating pollution uh, of, of the atmosphere. What we could consider doing, and I've told this to our, our, our politicians, is that we should consider taking the uh, waters from the uh, California aqueduct or Colorado River water. Uh, Colorado River water has three point 
zero millicolins of bicarbonate, which basically will form about 600 pounds of salt for every acre foot applied. California Aqueduct traditionally has uh, one and a half millicolins, will form about 300 uh, uh, pounds of precipitated salt in the soil profile for every acre foot applied. If we were to burn coal and capture the SO2 and wet scrub it to our water, we could give we could reduce the alkalinity, make more water, and produce a better quality water for our farmers. But we're too polarized, and we can't go there. And anyway, I just wanted to bring that out because I'm showing how we have to use science, true science, to help solve our problems with the environment and uh, with our, our farming goals. So we have this. Um, we have the SO2 coming the coal, from the coal-burning power plant, and it picks it up, and now it's falling on these, these areas here, and it's just lowering the pH way too much. Okay, next slide here is so, uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham's uh, soil food web uh, slide here, where she indicates that the uh, complexity of the soil food web, where like in a cave, there's no rainfall, there's no sunlight, there's no wind, there's really no inputs to change the ecosystem, so that's why it's so low. But you get out in the open, obviously it has increased a lot more. You go all the way up to rainforest, the, the greatest amount of carbon sequestration and complexity, again, what is the driver? The driver is just the volume of water, and the reason why I can say that confidently is because if we took the same amount of, of water that would fall on the rainforest and we applied it to some ground out here, we would not duplicate the rainforest. Why? Because we would probably salt affect the soil before we even got a chance to get there. It's not rainwater. It doesn't carry acidity. That's why. So look deep on all this, see the holistic big picture. All right, why is pH so important? Because the aperture openings within the root hairs of the plants that absorb the water and the nutrients contained in that water, they're based on pH. If the pH is incorrect for that plant, then the aperture openings can remain lethargic and, and stay stuck open, and it allows too much of the water and too much of the unwanted solubilized nutrients, sodium, boron, chlorides, to come into the plant, stressing it and then causing it to have low uh, uh, quality fruit and yield. But here, if you can control the pH, your balance of nutrients already become available. You have a lot of nutrients in your soils because you have not, usually these soils have not been leached out. So I contend that you can mine those nutrients and use less fertilizer and grow things more sustainably because you're going to control the pH and let the acidity solubilize the nutrients from that ecosystem. It's important to recognize that there are uh, structures of uh, amino acids, methionine, notice the sulfur, cysteine, notice the sulfur. Those elements are needed to create these amino acids and they're so important. I have growers that have uh, uh, durum wheat, very poor quality, but when they control the pH of the soil water solution, the durum wheat, the quality for making pastas, to make them where, where they're elastic and so forth. They're, they're there. And then also, uh, uh, I've had uh, sweet potato growers where they would grow things with poor pH condition and then put it in cold storage, but it would fall apart because, and, and have blossom end rot because the nutrients were not available at the time when the plant was growing to strengthen the cell structure and everything so it could hold up under cold storage. Nutrient quality is dependent on pH control. If we drank water, and we've heard of those situations in colleges where they have hazing and they have people drink a lot of water at, all at once and they die because the pH of their, within themselves has altered where their body functions, the cells and so forth can't work. Same thing with the plants. We are all under this pH uh, uh, arena. 
Okay, so your fruit is part of it. And so it, the, the sulfur is needed to, the, to uh, so help that crop grow, uh, virtually every crop grow, uh, and optimize the quality crop uh, and yields. Okay, so the vast majority of the water that we use for irrigation has no acidity and or provides sulfur in the wrong form. So rainwater, the finest irrigation water, but we don't get enough of it down here. If we use snow melt water, very low, uh, excuse me, very low uh, EC salts, uh, but the pH may be nine zero because the, most of the uh, constituents in the water is uh, the bicarbonate. But it's very low compared to uh, uh, California aqueduct uh, water uh, the frank kern water is about uh, 2.8 milliequivalents of bicarbonate, about a, th a third of the milliequivalent of, of uh, uh, California aqueduct. The lower Colorado River is 3.0, 600 pounds of salt formation, and so much higher, and then of course the groundwater, and you already know that the groundwater because you're pumping it out of limestone aquifers, you're pumping all of the minerals that have been leached out of the soil that's in that aquifer, and you're pumping it up and then uh, applying it to the surface. So that water usually has the greatest amount. And then of course, as I said earlier, we're exacerbating the problem because we're commingling our recycled water with a lot of our waters we use for irrigation. So key to sustainability is gonna be also, and this is where I think you folks have a voice. You have a voice because if you folks figure out what's been going on with the salt from the wastewater treatment plants, you'll start to recognize that, hey, you're the recipient of this water. It's causing you uh, problems and, and, and hurting your livelihood. And I think that the farmers, you know, if you're educated and you're, uni you're, you're, you're together and united, I think that you can clamor for a better quality water. Okay, so the major constituents in water is the positive charge cations, which are attracted to the negative charge anions. And what we focus on is the total alkalinity, because if we could eliminate the bicarbonate, we can really solve the problem with the water quality. We can lower the pH, but we can also start altering the pH of the soil water solution. Why? Because bicarbonate will bond with part, uh, positive charged salt, and in this case, it's calcium, and it forms scale. And you've all seen the scale on a shower stall or a sink, and even pipes will uh, uh, plug up, and you have the plugging problems, which turns the uh, ground into hard pan, and you form all this calcium carbonate, and the water cannot penetrate into the soil. But you also did one more thing. You, you suffocate your bacteria in your soil because they don't have access to oxygen and they can't breathe out the CO2. The soil does not breathe. So you lose the fertility and the productivity of your ground with bad water. Again, one millicolon per liter or 61 ppm of bicarbonate will approximate about 200 pounds of salt precipitating potential in an every acre foot of water. And when you have the pH out of whack, not only do you have very poor water penetration, you have things like iron chlorosis because the pH is too high, the, the plant, the aperture openings cannot get the nutrients it needs, and so it suffers, there's your non-point source pollution. The water is just running off the property, carrying the water and the, the fertilizer or pesticides and, and topsoil off the, off the property. Sodic soils, here's phytophthora issue where you don't get the water to penetrate, well, you're gonna rot your roots and then when wind blows, you lose your trees. Almonds up in the uh, Central Valley. Okay, so how do you take care of the lime problem at home? You use kaboom, lime away, an acidifying cleanser. So you spray it on and it bubbles. What is happening? The acid is dissolving the carbonate turning it into pure water and CO2, it bubbles. 
That's how we take care of the problem at home. Well, how do we take care of it in agriculture? We've been using sulfuric acid or we've been applying soil sulfur on the ground, but it takes forever and a day for the soil sulfur to react. So sulfur is not an acid, by the way. Sulfur, the way the acidifying reaction occurs when you apply soil sulfur is that the thiobacillus bacteria feed on the sulfur and create SO2, oxidizes it into SO2. And if there happens to be water moisture in the soil, when that happens, the SO2 bonds with the water to create H2SO3, splits off a of hydrogen, creates bisulfite, the bisulfite oxidizes to sulfate, let's go to the other hydrogen, that's how the acidifying reaction occurs. But sulfur is not acid. Free, there's two potential hydrogen in every molecule of water. So we want to liberate the hydrogen protons from the water. And then, of course, people use gypsum because gypsum calcium sulfate, two positive charges, stronger attraction to the soil exchange sites, and it's a game of musical chairs, the soil absorption ratio. If you have more calcium than sodium, then it'll knock off and dominate the soil exchange sites from, from, and keep the sodium from dominating and collapsing the soil. But it is not acid. Gypsum is neutral. But that's a way to get around to help get the water to penetrate. Okay, in 1955, Daryl and John Harmon invented a sulfur burner. And the genesis of the sulfur burner, I mean, I, I love history, and so when I talked to him about it, he would say, well, Dad and I, we, uh, we used to farm, uh, we had a dairy farm in Lamore, California. We had a stand of alfalfa that had already been growing. And when we grew that alfalfa stand with the Kings River water, surface water, we could grow a fairly decent stand. But when that water was not available and we had to use our deep well, and we, we pulled up this alkaline saline water and applied it to our alfalfa field, the alfalfa, John would say, would turn purple, want to crawl back into the ground and die. And so they called a extension advisor and asked them what to do. And they, and they told them, throw soil sulfur on the ground and th throw some gypsum out there, and that should, that's all we know to do. So they tried that, and they, it appeared to work somewhat, but then it quickly went back to the same problem. So what they did was they, they were like detectives. They wanted, which we should all be, be naturally curious. They took a backhoe, and they dug in the middle of their alfalfa field, and they saw that a caliche layer had formed right in the middle of the alfalfa roots. It was the calcium sulfate, the gypsum, bonding with the bicarbonate of that alkaline well water, and it formed that caliche layer, uh, and it created a perch water table. That's how they figured that out. And so then they said, well, what is the, what is the, how does that reaction work with the sulfur? The thiobacillus bacteria has to oxidize it into SO2. Hey, isn't oxidation the same word for burning? Why don't we burn the sulfur and we wet scrub the sulfur, the SO2 resulting gas, with the irrigation water, which is what they did. And that was the genesis of the uh, SO2 sulfurous acid generator process. And I will tell you right now, one of my goals in life, I want to put that machine in the Smithsonian Institution because I believe it is one of the greatest inventions of all humanity because this is the way we have, I believe, and I'm saying this right now, I believe that this is the method in which we have finally able to not just improve our agronomic conditions, but we can actually solve the vexing problem that has plagued humanity since the dawn of human civilization, soil salinity. The ancient Mesopotamians, they didn't have sulfur burner. They, they diverted Tigris, Euphrates River water and applied it to the ground and it salt affected their soil. It took them 4,000 years to do. My friends, we're retiring some of our farm ground, less than 50 years of practice irrigation. So we are, we are on a fast track to uh, oblivion if we do not understand uh, pH control for our farming systems. Anyway, so they created this uh, sulfur burner, uh, sulfurous acid generator, and uh, they started turning things around with uh, the farmers, but the quality of the sulfur was very poor, so the concept was right, but it wouldn't allow the machines to run properly. 
thankfully nowadays, we have a better quality sulfur in the right form and it flows through the machine very nicely. Okay, so here's how the machine works. We have uh, Bastille sulfur in a storage hopper that links to a burn chamber and we use pressurized water uh, through a aspirator inductor. And what that does is it, when, when, the, when the water is uh, fed to the unit, it's, it basically creates negative pressure vacuum of air into the burn chamber, like a carburetor would. And so once the sulfur is ignited, the resulting SO2 gas will be drafted and bonded with the water. Now we have the sulfurous acid solution here, which is going to be about a 2.0 pH, most cases. I've done work up in Wyoming on in the Powder River area when uh, 20 years ago where we're dealing with uh, really fracked water. They were basically mining natural gas and they had to puncture into uh, uh, coal bed methane fields and they had to dewater it. And that water had 1,600 ppm of bicarbonate, much worse than what you have. And the first pass through our machine, we could only bring the pH down from about, uh, let's say, eight or nine, we could bring it down to about five or six. That was for the first pass. In your case, you don't, you're not dealing with that type of water, fortunately. Okay, so now we have this uh, 2.0 pH water, which now we can either blend by gravity discharging in a reservoir, a canal, or siphon it and inject it into an irrigation line going out to your irrigation blocks and adjust the pH to what you want. I want to talk about this. <clears throat> the, the emissions of, of our equipment is very low. The air quality management boards do not have an issue at this time with our equipment because two pounds of fugitive material of vessel two may be allowed to uh, be released in the atmosphere in a 24 hour period of time, two pounds. So if we multiply 0 0.0042 of a pound in an hour by 24, you, you'll see that we come up to about 0.1 of a pound in a 24 hour period of time. And the reason why we're so efficient is because the way our machines are designed, but we have a wet scrubber that can scrub the SO2 that, that would try to escape in the atmosphere. You as farmers, you don't want to release that SO2 because you paid money to convert it to SO2 and you want to convert that to acid. You don't want to let it escape in the atmosphere because you'll be polluting, but you'll be wasting money. You want to, you want to capture it. Okay, so I, I, and the reason why I bring this up is because over the years, there have been other people trying to copy what we do, and they have their own variety. You just need to make sure that it's efficient in scrubbing, and then also you have to look at how much uh, uh, acid it actually makes, because not all units are the same. Okay, more chemistry. When, you're at, when you add SO2 to the water, the pH lowers and you start to form HSO3 by sulfite. When you get down to about 4.0, you notice that you don't form any uh, much as, uh, by sulfite anymore and you st it starts to go down and then you start to see the appearance of SO2 gas, free entrained SO2 gas into the water. And I have a picture of a wine bottle here because you folks probably drank some sulfurous acid last night. Wine. Winemakers will crush the grapes, they'll ferment the juice, and when the, they get to the target level for taste where they think they're going to sell a bunch of bottles of it or win the five gold medals at the World's Fair, they have to kill the bacteria or else the bacterial yeast will spoil the wine. So what they'll do is they'll inject SO2 from a pressurizing container into the fermented juice. As the SO2 is absorbed, it creates sulfurous acid, splits apart a hydrogen, and creates a bisulfite, HSO3, and that process keeps replicating until the, they bring the pH down to 4.0. Winemakers know this, so they'll bottle wine at 3.6, usually, because there's just enough free SO2 to, to arrest the fermentation process, and now they can store the wine and preserve it. Now we open a bottle of wine, we pour it from a long distance, because we're trying to vent out the SO2. And then the people do this, they're smelling the wine and enjoying it, but they're also releasing the SO2 because they don't want to drink that. Some people, asthmatic folks, they get reaction to it, headaches and, and you know, just reaction. Anyway, uh, 
but the wine will usually consume all of it. But if the conversation's bad, someone brings up the subject of politics, everyone starts getting mad at each other, get the heck out of the house, but the wine bottle hasn't been fully consumed, we put a cork back in the bottle, but because we allowed oxygen to come back into the bottle, the oxygen reacts with the HSO3, turns it into sulfate, let's go to the other hydrogen, that's how the wine goes to vinegar. It is the same chemistry that we would be doing to your irrigation water, and you can take advantage of this. Okay. This is the process, again, I explained it earlier, where we add the SO2 to the water and we split apart a hydrogen, and then we have the bisulfite, and then the oxidation occurs, and then turns it into sulfate, let's go to the other hydrogen. So you see how the hydrogen react? Now let's look at sulfuric acid, which is a strong acid uh, and synthetically made. It's H2SO4, not H2SO3. And the way the hydrogen protons uh, are donated, they donate all at once. And that's a definition of a strong acid. Weak acid is defined uh, sequential release of the hydrogen protons, which is this is the case. This, we have to take advantage of this. And I don't think the agronomic community has really understood this. And I've had to actually go toe to toe with many academic scientists uh, and professors teaching because I think the disconnect has been, they thought that pH control is through importing in acid, bring it into the system and adding the acid to the system. That's not the way nature does it. Nature doesn't call for a sulfuric acid vendor to dump a bunch of sulfuric acid into the ocean to keep the ocean from precipitating out a solution. She actually liberates the hydrogen from within her own system. That's how nature works. It's, it's not artificial. And so this process here, I'll illustrate why there is such a ad major advantage with sulfurous acid. If you have a situation where you, let's say you need 300 hydrogen proton to bring the pH of the water to 6.5, you're gonna use 150 units of sulfuric acid because H2SO4 will apply the two hydrogen in each compound, each unit, you're gonna release 300 hydrogen proton and you're gonna bring the pH of the water to 6.5. But I want you to know something. Notice that when you brought the pH to 6.5, you've only neutralized, now if you break this apart here, it'll be pure water and CO2. That's what carbonic acid is. And it isn't an acid because it's not free hydrogen, but the point I'm making here is you've only neutralized less than 42% of the total alkalinity of the water. So if you're using California aqueduct water and you bring the pH of the water to 6.5 with sulfuric acid, instead of forming 300 pounds of salt, you're only forming about 160. You've slowed it down, you've helped yourself, you may see some results, but you haven't gone the distance. You haven't gotten rid of all of the bicarbonate. That's the inherent problem with a strong acid. Now, what we're gonna do is we're going to burn, oxidize 300 units of sulfur to create 300 units of H2SO3. That's a total of 600 hydrogen proton that's gonna release. The first 100, or excuse me, the first 300 is gonna be released here to bring the pH to 6.5. But in the 6.5 pH water, we want to carry the other 300 hydrogen protons within the 6.5 water through the irrigation system safely because since it's still bonded, it's not free hydrogen, so it can't attack the metals. We've got to protect our conveyance system. But as it goes out through the irrigation system, it'll clean the bacterial slime that forms inside drip lines and emitters and keep them clean, so now you've restored the uniform distribution of your irrigation water, which is really important too. But now everything's clean. If you're delivering the 6.5 pH water with the bisulfite through the emitters onto the soil, now you're delivering acid to the soil. Now you're going to be able to neutralize the remaining 58% of the total alkalinity because pH is a logarithmic scale, meaning tenfold difference between each point. So if you're, let's say, going from eight to seven, that's tenfold difference. If you're going from eight pH to six, that's a uh, hundred. If you're going from eight to five, that's a thousand. So 
you have to recognize that now, the further acidic we go, we need less acid. So we're able to neutralize 100% of the total alkalinity with this process, but we're going to have residual acidity left over. And that leftover residual acidity is going to start dissolving the native carbonates that are already in your soil or formed from previous untreated irrigations. That is the benefit of using this particular process. Now, so just a classical way of illustrating the formula here. We can bring the pH of the water to 6.5, but there's no residual acidity left in solution. Here we can bring the pH of the water to 6.5 with sulfurous acid and still have the other half of the acid available to go to the soil. Now you start to really start changing uh, the ecosystem and start getting the pH just right for the crop you're trying to grow. Why? Because when you deliver water, let's say you use sulfuric acid and it has sulfate, you're not delivering free hydrogen proton to dissolve the carbonates. It requires two free hydrogen protons to neutralize carbonates. And so if you deliver water with bisulfite, now that oxidation of the bisulfite is going to occur and it's going to give you the uh, needed amount of acid to start dissolving the uh, carbonates in the soil and create that pore space throughout the soil. Now you've increased field capacity, you've allowed oxygen to penetrate deeper in the soil, and nature does miraculous things with the bisulfite because, it, like I said, it energizes bacteria. And so you create this condition where you're replicating what nature does with rainwater. And now imagine if you could irrigate with water that is like rain or has the acidity all year long. Instead of waiting for the precious rain to come and it doesn't come as often as we want, but if you can replicate that supplementally, artificially with your irrigation water, now you're ahead of the game. You're gonna cause that ground to behave as though it's in a high rainfall area. So, well, I want you to start thinking of, this is a take home message right here, is that soil always takes on the characteristics of the materials applied upon it. So if you amend water with SO2, you're gonna liberate the acidifying hydrogen protons, you're gonna create bisulfite from the irrigation water, and you're gonna deliver it to the soil. You combine that with rainwater, you're accelerating the overall amount of hydrogen protons and bisulfite a geographic area would receive under normal conditions. In other words, you are going to do what it might take millions of years for Mother Nature to do with natural rainwater. Because what, and this is how I wrote the petition to get this passed for organic crop production. I wrote the petition as though the SO2 sulfurous acid generator is a miniature volcano. We are replicating the natural acidification process. And so your ecosystem that you have, you don't have that. Some of you do, some of you don't. But the, the ones that don't have that, you're not able to recondition and liberate the hydrogen from the water and do the same thing that nature does. If you start doing that, now you can start taking bad ground with acidified water and you can reclaim it and put it into productive use. We can turn deserts into oasis. There was a comment earlier about rainforest deforestation. This is your moment. You can transform some of this ground that's not a rainforest, and you could turn it into productive carbon sequestrating ground. And you're going to measure it in terms of yield and quality of crop and you're gonna use water. And by the way, you have to, in order to leach out salts, you have, you're gonna use uh, uh, water with drip, but you gotta move more salts with less water. How are you gonna do that? The only way you're gonna do that is with acidity. You gotta make the water carry acidity to keep those pathways in the soil, soil uh, pore space profile open. Here's an example how I, we proved this. Down in Coachella Valley, uh, the 2011 date palm site, 40 acres, never farmed before. Look at the pHs, 9.6, 9.8, 10.10, 8.8 on the top foot. 
EC, 61, a top foot's 97, 33, 72. You need to have 2.5 or less in EC to have favorable agronomic conditions. These guys are way off the charts. So we turned on the sulfur burner, sulfurous acid generator, and we brought the pH of the water to 6.5, and they carried that 6.5 water carrying the bisulfite onto their uh, spots where they're uh, gonna plant the trees, and they drip, they flood irrigated with their drip emitters where the trees were gonna be. And I said, just turn it on and let, let's see how far the water penetrates. And so a few days later, they said, well, okay, the water's down to about five foot. It's penetrating. Well, the only way the water could have penetrated is the acid had to uh, dissolve the pore space to create the pathways for the water to leach the salts. So they said, okay, it's down five feet. I said, go ahead and plant your, your date palm because that's the rooting depth and as long as you keep treating your water, you'll keep moving the salts down and open up the pathways. So they did. And so after the first irrigation of that flooding, look what we did to the first foot. Went from 61 to 33 EC, 97 to 5.2, 33 to 18, 72 to 2.9, and then five months, six months later, I believe, uh, they did another pH test, and the pH obviously went from 9.6 to 8.4, 9.8 to 7.9, 10.10 to 8.5, 8.15. 8.8 to 8.4, and the ECs dropped. 2.4, 1.46, 2.2, this one, this corner, uh, this anomaly, it probably had more calcium carbonate in the soil, and that's why it didn't uh, affect the pH uh, as, as dramatically as the other locations. Then two years later, they did another test to follow up on it, and the pH continues to drop, and the, PA, uh, the ECs have been lowered into the range that's favorable. So the acceleration of acidity works. Okay, and I know you folks are, wow, I didn't see that design there. <laughs> I guess that's what happens when the new version meets the old version. Um, anyway, I did a, a, an apples to apples comparison where I had to use the formulas and figure out exactly if we had 600 moles of hydrogen derived from sulfurous acid and we had 600 moles of hydrogen derived from sulfuric, if the price is $365 a ton for elemental sulfur, that's 99.9 pure, that's why I added the 0.1%, and the cost of sulfuric is $175 plus the 7% because it's 93% usually, to make it apples to apples, 600, there's the material cost, 3.84, 6.12. So you, basically the bottom line is you can, do, you can create twice the amount of acidity for about 63% the material cost of sulfuric, and not to mention the safety factor of it. Okay, so how would you decide to, to, to utilize this or integrate this into your system? Well, you have to know what the bicarbonate level of your water is, because I know afterwards people are gonna ask, well, well how do I get started, what's the, what's the cost and all that? I need to know what the bicarbonate level is of the water, so your water analysis will tell that, and then once I know what the maximum and minimum flow rate is gonna be, I can then size a piece of equipment for you and tell you exactly how much sulfur you need to oxidize. And then once we know the size, if we can figure out what the uh, particulars to integrate into your system. Do you irrigate out of a well? Do you irrigate out of a reservoir? Uh, do you have three-phase electrical power? Th those sort of things. This is my last slide. So as I said, I'm the person that wrote the petition to get this uh, organically approved. Uh, I have to say, as I look back, that was a wonderful experience because it really opened my eyes to seeing the bigger picture. And as you can see, when I wrote that petition, I looked for what nature does. Because, like I said earlier, you cannot be sustainable unless you emulate what nature does.
you're probably small, but it would be, the, to me, the path to do this would be to uh, maybe get our smallest machine, and the smallest machine that we have is, it's all stainless steel, pretty much, and we have equipment that are over 30, 40 years old still in service, so they, they last if you take care of it. But anyway, uh, you put it on a trailer, and if you can talk some of your other uh, farming buddies to go in the cost of that, and you have a vat where you can go and make your sulfurous acid, fill up your vat, and then your, your friend can take the unit and go and fill up his vat, and you just say, move the unit around, then you could, that might be the way to solve the problem. But it's gonna be determined on the size of the vat you can get, because you wanna make sure you have enough to go through, uh, amend your water so that you have enough uh, uh, acidity and amended water to, to, to go out on your crop. Another thing is you may not, uh, you may not wanna do uh, every irrigation where you amend the water, because after all, you've been doing it without it and you've, you've done okay, but if you can do it every time you irrigate to prevent the soil from accumulating the precipitated salts, that's what I would recommend. But, uh, you know, again, sustainability. What can you do with your own particular operation? It may not be sustainable for you to uh, actually purchase one. But the other side you need to recognize too is the increased quality crop and yield. How does that figure to the bottom line? Now, I work with some avocado growers and it's not my business to ask them particularly exactly how much extra they've made. You know, that's, that's obviously that's confidential information, but I will tell you this, there are uh, so berry growers, strawberries, uh, cotton, all the uh, growers, uh, almonds, I, we work a lot with almonds. One of them has over 200 uh, units of our machines. They're the biggest uh, nut grower in the world. They, they have doubled their yields and the quality. So, and I'm not kidding, it's not just one particular crop. Now, will that happen with everyone? It depends on how good a farmer you are and your particular situation. Well, it depends on your dozing rate of how much you add. If, let's say, Let's say you're one of those farmers that spots a ground that's really bad, you got it cheap, and you wanted to uh, put it in production and get a good rate of return real quick. Are you gonna do it slow or are you gonna do it fast? You're gonna wanna acidify and accelerate the amount of acid. So in other words, instead of bringing the pH to 6.5, you may wanna bring it to 5.5 or 5.0, get that acid out there, open up the soil, and then back off. And so you can maintain the pH what you want. Now, if you start lowering the pH too much, because this is one of the questions that was asked to me when I uh, wrote the petition and stood before the organic board, what if the pH goes down too low? I said, well, that's an easy solution. Turn the machine down or turn it off. And then the alkalinity of the irrigation water is gonna bring the pH back up of the soil because soil always takes on the characteristics of the materials applied upon it. So, by the way, not too far from here, up north, there was a guy that had uh, uh, 100, well not 100, but he had a large acreage of property that he wanted to, he had an opportunity to grow uh, organic or conventional blueberries. And he was at that fork in the road, and, but he knew th the pH of the soil was perfect because the only water that hit that ground was natural rainwater. So that's why the soils were good. But he knew that if the moment he started using his alkaline saline well water, it's gonna transform his ground. So he made the right choice. He got the sulfur burner, sulfurous acid generator, treated the water, he's growing organically, he's doing well. And so that's the, you know, the, those are things you, you're gonna have to figure out uh, how to do. So, sodium, positive charge, bonds with negative charge sulfate. Now you have sodium sulfate because it is now balanced. It can't attach to the soil exchange sites. Now it's soluble and it'll leach with the water. Good question. Okay, fertigation and uh, the, the reaction with it. I would say you need to consider amending the water to 6.5 before you fertigate because 
By the way, I network with Dr. Thomas Ruhr, the former soil science professor at Cal Poly, uh, for about 15 years. And one of the things, we were on a field trip, you know, out in the Central Valley, and one of the things he told me was, uh, gosh, these people are adding all this ammonia bisulfite. We're adding, wait, ammonia, and hydrous ammonia to the water. And the pH was nine going out. And we just turned on our, our, our brand new Model 100, which would burn about 130 pounds of sulfur an hour. We are treating 10,000 gallon a minute flow. But the pH was so high. And I said, and he looked at me and he just said, do these people realize that when the pH is uh, 8.5, they're gonna lose about 40% of the uh, anhydrous ammonia because it's just gonna volatize out of the water, just like chlorine would if you have high pH in your swimming pool. Volatize it right out. If they brought the pH down to 7.5, they would lose about 10%. It'll, because it'll hold better, because the, the water is in a super saturated. There's more room space in between the molecules. But if they brought the pH to 6.5, they'd lose 1%. So I think I'm trying to answer your question. If you, if you adjust the pH of your water uh, before you fertigate, you'll be able to use less fertilizer, and you'll be able to hold more of that fertilizer and actually let it uh, go to your soil. 